All right, come on, grab your, grab your study notes, grab your Bible. Let's see what the Lord wants to say to us on tonight as we, as we continue. Um, really probably put a, a, a cap on our prayer series. We've been talking about prayer uh, for the last several months now. And it's been my prayer, it's been my prayer that prayer uh, has gotten on you. Anybody has amped up their prayer life? Anybody's been praying more? Anybody been calling on the name of the Lord? That's, that's been my intent. And I was just talking to somebody the other day. It escapes me who it was. Uh, but they were saying that they, they, they had a prayer life. But since we've been ministering on this, uh, they've taken their prayer life just to another, another place, another level. Um, and I think it is so important. Um, and I always, always make, make mention this because I really want you to know um, that God is able. Whatever his word um, is revealing or showing us, Jesus said in one passage of scripture, he says, as he was teaching, the presence of the Lord or the anointing was there. It was present um, to be able to do what it was that he was ministering about. So if we've been talking about prayer, I pray that you have been tapping in and really been very sincere about uh, about praying. And even uh, we, was, we was here the other day and had a couple of the staff people up here. They were clean, doing what we need to do. I pulled them all together. I said, come on, we've been pushing everybody to pray at 12. We're going to pray at 12 together. Come on. And we stood right in this sanctuary and we prayed and called on the name of the Lord. And I believe that God is going to shift some things uh, because of our intentionality and our purpose to be able to talk to him in everything that we do. Anybody believe that with me? Anybody believe that? <clears throat> I mean, that's not hype. That's not hype. That's my, that's my confidence in him. A lot of times when people look at our lives, um, they, they see where we are, um, but they really don't know um, what it is that we've gone through to get to where we are. Uh, you, you've heard it said that you know my, you, you, see, you see my glory, but you don't know my what? You don't know the story. You, you, you see where I am. You see what God has done in my life, but I don't think that a lot of times we, we don't afford people the opportunity to be able to kind of peek behind the curtain uh, to be able to see those things that God has done in our lives and, trans and transpired in our lives to get us to where we are in our current lives. And God does so many things to prepare us, to really not even for where we are uh, momentarily, but God does so many things uh, in, the, in the behind the scenes times, in the times the way grooming us and developing us that that kind of postures us for what it is he desires to do in our lives such is the case of the sweet psalmist from Israel by the name of David David had a lot of things that transpired in his life and David went through a lot of different things in his life but can I tell you the things that David went through uh, was for a purpose even his mistakes and we'll see that even in a moment even in the mistakes that David made in his life it was working together for his good that where he can be able to get God some glory and give God some honor David the Bible calls him a man that's after God's own heart and David is truly a man Man that, that, that was purposeful in doing what he needed to do in order to glorify God in every situation. So let's look at this. We're going to look at Psalm 30 tonight. Psalm 30. Psalm 30. We're going to look at that because this is truly a psalm of thanksgiving. Somebody say a psalm, a psalm. of thanksgiving. There are a lot of different psalms, and you've heard me, if you've been hanging around me any length of time, you know of all the different types of psalms. There's psalms for, for repentance, and there's psalms of praise, and there's psalms uh, of celebration. There's psalms of, of, of sorrow and pain and death, but this particular psalm is a psalm of thanksgiving. And I don't know about you, David really is testifying. By the time we get to Psalm 30, David is testifying about the things that has transpired in his life and has gotten him to where he is. Is, and now he's simply looking back over what God has pulled him from. And in Psalm 30, he's giving God praise. He's thanking God for all the things that he has gone through. Look, let's look at it. Psalm chapter 30. Psalm 30, rather. Psalm is the book of songs. They don't have chapters. Uh, they, but no, they have just, you know, it's chapters in our Bible so we can find them. But I say that for school and ministry. Don't worry about it. Psalm 30. Psalm 30. Look, look at verse 1. Psalm 30. But I will tell you that there are five divisions. I've been meaning to say this when I preach from Psalms. There are only five divisions in the book of Psalms. So don't ever, if you ever get a chance to get up and read the scripture, don't say turn to the 28th division of Psalms. It sounds good, but that's not the truth. Amen. There's only five divisions. Just say Psalm 28. Just say Psalm 35. There's only five divisions. You sound real ignorant when you used to get up and talking about the turn to the 150th division of Psalms. You sounding deep. Anybody ever try to sound deep and then you sound crazy at the same time? But then that's kind of what that is. But anyway, let's turn to the 30th division of Psalms. Psalm, Psalm. 
Psalm, Psalm 30. Look, look what David said. David said, I bet you're going to remember that, though. Look, look, David said, I will extol you. This is what David said. David said, I will extol you. He said, I'm going to extol you. I'm going to lift you up, O Lord. Look what he says. For you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. This is David. David is saying, God, I'm going to extol you. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to magnify magnify you. He said, God, because you draw me up and out. And David said, I'm grateful that you've done this for me. He said, because you did not allow my foes or my enemies to rejoice after me or over me. Anybody grateful to the fact that God has not allowed the enemies to see their desire on your life? Come on here. Can I tell you that your enemy have a desire? They want to see you crumble. They want to see you divorce. They want to see you broke. They want to see you angry. But David said, God, I'm glad because you you lifted me out of the pit. You lift me up out of a place to where I was down. And God, you've done this in my life. So because of that, I'm thankful. And because of that, I'm going to extol you. As I've told you, this is a psalm of what? Thanksgiving. This is a psalm of Thanksgiving. So many of the theologians that really divide it to the point to where they, they, they were trying to really put a finger on why David wrote this particular psalm. And really that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show us. We're going to walk through um, the different scenarios and we're going to walk through the context of the song. I just said this. The way a lot of people know they see our glory. They see your glory, but they don't know your story. So we, we, we can read Psalm 30, but for us to really appreciate Psalm 30, we need to know what got the psalmist into Psalm 30. So we're going to look back over the life of David and let's see what it is that transpired in his life that got him to Psalm Psalm 30. Let's look at it. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 1. Look what the Bible says. It said, now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. Verse 2 says, the king said to Nathan the prophet. See now, look what he says. I dwell in a house of cedar. But the ark of God dwells in a tent. Now here David is the king over Israel. You know that David, it, it was a process. Say process. There was a process that got David from getting the oil of God until he finally got to sit on the throne of being the king over all of Israel. Some 13 years. Did you know that? Some 13 years from the time that the prophet came and anointed him until David was the king over all of Israel. The, 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 the prophet anointed him and he wasn't anointed to lead right there. No, he was only anointed to serve. He wasn't anointed uh, to be out in the forefront, but he was anointed to serve. And then he became the king of just Judah, just the two smaller tribes. And then eventually, say eventually, he became the king over all of Jerusalem. But here, that was 13 years. Isn't it amazing how when God can speak a word to us and God can do something or show us something and then we just think we're supposed to walk in it the next day? No, my friend, there is a problem said there's a process that goes on and now David is the king and he's there in his palace and he's looking around in his palace and he's seeing all of the decadence of his palace seeing all the decor looking at all the crown mold and seeing all the marble seeing all the things that he has in his palace and he says to the prophet Nathan he said I dwell in this nice house and he said, look at the ark of God. The ark of God is the sim is symbolism to the presence of God. Now, we know, let me say from the onset, that God is too big to dwell in any house. It doesn't matter how big a facility we build. It's not big enough for God. Come on here. It, it doesn't matter how, how pretty it is and what it is that we do. God can, does not dwell in tents. He does not dwell in buildings. It is just a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a metaphorical thing that we say, this is the house of God. You know why? Because he's omnipresent. He's at every place at every time. But it's when we come into this house that our attention and our focus is on him that he manifests himself. Come on. This is his house. We, we don't invite him in. But know what he does is that he invites us in. And this is what God does. He invites us in to where we can be able to experience his presence. And I'm grateful for that. But David is looking at his house. He said, how is it that I'm living like I'm living but God is in a tent? 
David is saying, look, I, I can look. I got all the finer things of life. I got all of the amenity. David said, I don't have a back porch. David said, I got a lanai. Come on, talk to me. <laughs> D -D David said, David said, I don't, I got, I got some nice things. Come on here. D David said, look, look at in my house. Come on here. I got, yo, the Lord done brought me from the sheep coat to where I am. I got a, I got a seat in my shower. David said, I got, I got, I got the, the, the water can hit me from all angles. I can take the thing over there. Look, David said, look how I'm living and look, look at what God, you know, that's living on Hound Hall when you can take the thing off of you. You know, you, 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 are, you, are, you are made it now when you, can, when you can do something like that. That's what, that's what David is saying. David says, I, 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 desire, I desire to do something. Look at verse 2. Look what he says. And Nathan said to the king, look at this, it's very important. Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So David insinuated because of the fact that God was dwelling and living in this tent. He said, I desire to build God a temple. He wants to build God a house that is so bigger, so much stronger than anything that they have ever seen. And the prophet Nathan said, go king and do all that is in your heart. He said, the Lord, the Lord is with you. Now, Nathan is a man of God. Nathan is the same one in a few chapters. A few chapters, Nathan will be that same one that comes in this same palace and tells King David after King David messes up with Bathsheba. He tells him a little parable and tells him a story about a man that had these little wee lambs. And here David, the, the man in the story, took someone's wee lamb instead of taking one of their own. And David said, where are, where are they? Take me to them. And we got to kill them. And the man, and Nathan said to him, thou art the man. You are the man. So Nathan is a man of God. Nathan is a prophet, and he tells the king to go and do everything that's in your heart, for God is with you. But, but when you continue to read in the story, God encourages David. God blesses David, but God tells David, you can't build me a house. Look, yeah, I think you missed it. The prophet told him, he said, go do all that's in your heart. We've got to be careful listening to people co-signing us and telling us what it is that, that, that we're supposed to do and how we ought to be doing it. And the Lord said to Nathan, he said, Nathan, why you said that to him? I ain't told you Nathan. I could help it. I had to do it. I just had to do it. I set it up for two minutes for me to be able to get that. So I, he said, why you told David? I, told, I didn't tell you to tell him Nathan. You didn't, I didn't say Nathan to you. Na Nathan, why you said that? I didn't say, I didn't say Nathan. But, but look, look, <laughs> look at what God says uh, through, through the man of God, through Nathan. He comes back. Look at verse 12. That's so funny to me. I said that earlier and it was funny. I said it again and it was funny. Look, look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, when, when your days are fulfilled, you go home and read the, read the chapter. Then we get a chance. I don't got time. I'll let y'all get back to the turkey. So, look. He said, when, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13 says, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. So David, David, God encourages him and he said that, that what I'm trying to do, uh, what I'm trying to do for you, David, I'm not going to let you build a house, but I'm going to let your offspring build it. And then not only that, there's one coming after your offspring that's going to sit on the throne forever. What, what, is, what is God telling David? Not only would his son Solomon build the temple, but also there's another son that's in the wings that's going to come and we shall call his name Emmanuel. We shall call his name Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We shall call his name the lily in the valley, the bright and the morning star. Come on, we, we shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is, that, is that son. He's going to sit on the throne forever. Is there somebody coming? So what, what, what does this mean? Because we're still talking about prayer, but believe it or not, look, look at this because David gets the shock of his life. And this is what my first principle is. Genuine prayer prepares me. For when God says no. <laughs> I said genuine prayer prepares me for when God said no. Listen to this story. Now, David asked God, could he build the temple? And th this is what this Psalm 30, this Psalm 30. Now, if you don't, if you got a good Bible, a good study Bible, not one of the old cheap Gideon Bibles or something like that. I ain't trying nothing wrong with the Gideon Bible. I, I, I got to stop saying that because Gideon is really good. They pass out those Bibles. So if you got, if you, if you don't, if you have a lesser quality Bible, come on here, and not a good study Bible, on top of your superscription in your Bible, it'll say a song at the dedication of the temple, which we'll see that in a moment. David writes a song 
for the dedication of the temple that he wants to build. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what's the problem? God said you can't build it. <laughs> I think y'all miss me. He, he, David writes a song for the, to be sung at the dedication of the temple. Now, whether David wrote this before God told him no or after God told him no, be that as it may, David shows his maturity in this matter. This is like David, this is like you you trying to, you want to you build a house. You're saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to build my dream house. It's going to be so many thousand square feet. I'm going to do it and put this in this room and that in that room. And you're going to get your big old storage facility, a huge storage facility, and you start buying furniture and you start putting it in there. You got an air conditioned climate control storage facility. You put your plastic over there. You got your living room set. You got your den. You got your, your movie room. You got your master bedroom. You got your guest room, your money law suite. You got all this stuff, all this furniture in there, and you ready and you're primed to build, and God says no. This is the magnitude of what's going on here. Here, David is, in, is anticipating building God a house. But I love David in this because David did not do like most of us do. David did not pout. But David knew that God told him no. Listen to this. And he literally set his son up for success. We give, we give Solomon all of the credit for building the temple, but David is the one that got all the gold together, all the silver together, all of the timber together. And you read it uh, as you look through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles and look at all the building and the, and the construction of the temple. It was David that got all of that stuff together and had it all laid out because it was his plan to do this. Now, why did God tell David he couldn't do it? Many suggest because he was a man of war. He had shed too much blood. Many suggest because all of the things that he was in involved in that God told him no it doesn't matter why God told him no the point is that he told him so I want to ask you a question what if that thing that you just want to do so bad and you just think that this is what God would have you to do what will you do when he says no oftentimes you know what we do we do it anyway. Oftentimes, that's what we, we do it anyway because a lot of times we put our word out there. We've said some things. A lot of times we've said this and we said that. And this is what individual, because I'm putting my word out there. Now I don't want to look like I'm this or look like I'm that. But I, can I tell you, it doesn't matter. I don't care how you look at me. I want God to look at me as an obedient son. I don't care if you look at me and say, well, I, I thought you was going to do this. I thought you was going to do that. Well, that's not. that was not God's plan. That was not God's will. David teaches me something. He writes a song to be sung at a temple dedication for a temple that he couldn't build. David didn't say, I ain't, I ain't writing nothing. I can't build a house. I'm not going to write them nothing. No, David said, no, I can't build it, but I'm still going to I'm gonna put forth some praise so they can do what they, what they need to do. David shows some, he shows some maturity. You'll see it in a moment. <clears throat> Look at the maturity of David. Because he says, God, even when God tells us no, David was told by the prophet, go and do it. But then God came back and said, no, that's not going to happen. That's one of the reasons that many theologians suggest that David wrote this song. The other reason why they think that David wrote this song is because of his sin. They, they, they say this is a response to God from David because of his sin. Not, not his sin with Bathsheba. That's Psalm 51. That's Psalm 51. That's his response to the, his sin with Bathsheba. But in Psalm 30, this is his sin that when David numbered the people. David numbered the people. What, what is the sin in numbering the people? The sin is God said not to do it. <laughs> But what's, what's the problem with just counting people? What's the problem with just trying to see how many soldiers? And isn't that counting the cost? Isn't that being responsible? Isn't that being what it is that I should do? That's good logic, but it's not good faith. Y'all miss what I said. If God tells me not to do it, it doesn't matter how logical it is. It doesn't matter how rational it is. We cannot follow God based off logic and based off a rationale. No, the just ought to live by what? Faith. Just, just because it look good, smell good, taste good, and this is what makes good common sense. This might not make good common faith. And here God told David not to number the people. Why, David? Why not to number the people? Because Israel's strength was never in their army. Israel's strength was not never in how many troops they had, how many how many quads they had, how many military giants they had. No, it was never in that their strength was in their God. Yeah. 
And what God was telling Israel is, no, when you start numbering the people, you think that this is what's defending you. You think this is what's helping you. One, well, God was so, was so serious about this. I'm going to give you two instances. I wish Gideon was here because Gideon would tell you that here God dwindled his army all the way down to how many? 300 men, 300 committed men that be able to walk with like water like a dog. You so say, you know everything. They be able to walk with water like a dog. Can I tell you that God dwindled that army all the way down? The way, can I tell you, God can save by many or God can save by few. It doesn't take everybody. God just needs somebody. And come on, we got to stop complaining about what, what people at and what people doing. And we got to work with the ones that God has sent us. And so that Gideon is one. But then God was so serious about his other army. He told the King Jehoshaphat, you'll find in First First Chronicles chapter twenty, verse number fifteen. He says, "You have no need to fight in this battle." He said, "For the battle is not sure." He was so serious; they didn't even let them fight. They were outnumbered. And here, God told them, "Before you go out to war, He said, don't send Rambo, don't send your toughest warrior.' No, no, no." He said, "When you go out, send the praise team." He said, "Send the baritones, the monotone, the sopranos, the alto, and I want you to sing unto the Lord." The God was so serious it had nothing to do with an army because God said it. I'm gonna I'm gonna fight your battle. But David, David did not do that. Look at First Chronicles chapter 21, verse, verse number one. Look what it says. Then Satan stood against Israel and enticed David to number Israel. Then Satan stood against Israel. See, see, we think that the devil only entices us uh, sexually with money with perversion but no satan also entices us for us to stop trusting in god and begin to trust in our own strength the, the bible says he enticed he enticed david this is what the, 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 one of his names is the accuser of the brother this is what he does read it when you get a chance and in zachariah that little minor prophet zachariah that you flip too fast you're gonna go right past in zachariah chapter three the bible says zachariah got a vision of the high priest joshua standing in the temple he was standing in the presence of god standing there worshiping god standing there giving god glory and honor and the bible says and satan was right there accusing him he was accusing him. And the Bible says that Joshua was standing there and he was in his priestly guard. He was in his priestly royalty. But yet he was, he was dirty and he was filthy standing before God. And that's exactly what the devil does when we come into the presence of God. This is why some people don't give themselves over fully into worship because they know what they did. They, and, and Satan entices us and say, oh, now you want to raise your hand. Oh, now you want to worship. You wasn't worshiping when you were doing this. You wasn't praising when you were doing that you a hypocrite oh come on can I tell you that Satan gets us that way he knows what we did he knows how many times we did it and he tried to stop us from worshiping oh but anytime come on I'm going to preach real quick anytime the devil reminds you of your past you need to remind that booger of his future come on here somebody. anytime the devil reminds you of what you did he need to remind him yeah that's right I did do that but can I tell you one day you're going to be thrown in the pits of hell and it's going to be burning it's going to be burning and burning and burning I did do that. I did say that. I did go there. Oh, but the blood, the blood, the blood. The blood washed me and cleansed me and purged me. And that's why we come here to say thank you. Yes, sir. Bump it up a little bit. Bump it up a little bit. Bump the air up a little bit. It's cold in here. Lord, have mercy. Can I tell you that this is why, this is why we, we tell God thank you. And here, they, David is here. David is here enticing. He's the Satan is there enticing David. I, I often think about, anytime I read this, I often think about uh, some things I used to do in high school. Come on here. Y'all, y'all, y'all are not, y'all are not, y'all are not where I am. I mean, the thing is, y'all, y'all was saved before y'all was saved, but not me. I, I wasn't saved before I was saved. I was a little bad, little something. Come on, that's why I'm praying every time I lay hand on that bed. I say, the blood, the blood, the blood. Don't, don't that, like, like, cancel every seed I got in the ground. <laughs> and y'all start speaking that stuff. He gonna be a little just like you. No, no, no. The, 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 the Lord be against you. But listen. <laughs> listen, I remember in school, it was nothing like it, it was nothing like being in school and you knew somebody was about to fight. It was something that twisted it going around there. I mean, when it was a fight, boy, I mean, it just, you could just feel it in the air. And come co couple years real quick, baby, couple years. Especially when it was two girls. Come on here. You might have would have seen something. Come on. You might have seen some stuff, some stuff jumping out when, when it was. The, so, so, so every now and then, 
every now and then, I would, I would entice a fight. I'd say, you going to let her talk to you like that? She said, your mama be lying, just, try, just trying to see a fight. You know, y'all, y'all, they, y'all ain't never did nothing like that. Y'all don't, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, no, we was a peacemaker. No, we, we prayed for peace. Hell, y'all, if y'all didn't, y'all, if y'all, is let somebody fight who you didn't like. You ain't even had to be in the fight. You didn't want them to hit that ground and you. <laughs> ain't nobody ever stopped. Y'all, y'all, boy, y'all so say Y'all ain't never hit, no, somebody hit the ground and you stepped up. Come on, there we go, there we go. All right, you ain't never did that. Okay, all right, y'all so say Look, but look, <laughs> look. This is what Satan is doing. Satan is enticing David. He's there egging David on to do something, to, to disobey God. And this is what the enemy does. He entices us. He's accused of the brother. He tried to set us up to be able to do something. Then when we do it, he's nowhere to be found. That's how he starts issues in the church. He, he throws a rock and hides his hand. But look, let's see what happens. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 2. It says, so David said to Joab, and the commander of the army, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. Verse 3, but Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Look what Joab said. Joab says, king, it's not about how many people we have because God can breathe on whatever we have and it can be a hundred times more. Come on, Joab, understand it's not about the strength in numbers. Our strength is in Yahweh. Our strength is in God. And look what he says. Are they, are they not, my Lord, the king? All of them, my Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Don't do this, king. Why should it be a cause of guilt? For Israel. Verse 4, look what happens. But the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all of Israel and came back to Jerusalem. It's real, it's real sad when, when, the, when the person that is the servant has a voice of reason, but the person in authority don't want to hear. There's always, God always, hear me real good. God always gives us warning before destruction. God always put people in our ear and people around us. I wouldn't do that if I was you. I don't know if that, I don't know if that's God or not. I don't know if that's what you need to do. But but the king, the Bible said the king's word prevailed against Joab, and they began to number the people. And of course, because God told King. Now, David is not just the 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 he's not just the political leader being the king. David is the religious religious leader as well. David has the highest office in the land and he does this and because he did this it affected everybody who was following him. Y'all miss what I said. Because he did this it affected everybody that was connected to him. Let's see how this affected everybody. First Chronicles chapter 21 verse 8 the Bible says and David said to God I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing but now please take away the iniquity of your servant for I have acted very foolishly. David owns up to what he did. He owned up and said he should not have done it. But why, why is David Why is David all of a sudden now repenting? Why is David all of a sudden doing this and saying this? You got to read the chapter and get a chance. Because now God is punishing the people for, da for David's error. And that's why it is so important that you connect it to the right person. That you connected to the right man or woman of God or even in your home. Come on here. Or even in your circle. You got to be connected to the right people because their folly will be your folly. Come on here. Their foolishness. You got to pay the piper for, for, their, for their foolishness. And here, look, look what happened. Let me, let me speed up. Look what it said. First Chronicles 21, 14. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. Look at this. And 70,000 men of Israel fell. <coughs> 70,000 people lost their lives for David getting in his pride. That's why we got to pray for our president. The way we, he does not up there just trying to prove a point and picking fights with other countries and picking fights with this and that and just saying stuff and just doing stuff because it's our, it's our men and our women and we're the ones that got to fight on behalf of someone else's short few. But don't you leave that at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue because there's some things that we got to go through and we experience because of our short few or because of our pride or because of our opening up our mouth. Now other people got to pay the piper. And David, David, uh, there were 70,000 people. 
it fell because of David's, uh, David's mistake. Look at it. Verse 15, it gets better. Look what it says. And God, we said talking about prayer. You're going to see it right here in a second. And God sent the angel to Jerusalem to do what? To destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, look at this. The Lord saw and he relented from the calamity. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was a, it didn't seem like that was a praise break. That's a praise break right there. God, God, God sent the angel to destroy, but God says, no, it's enough. And see, so many people wrestle with these texts, especially uh, millennials, especially people who have issues with the church. They wrestle with these type of texts, and they'll say, if God is so loving, why would God destroy people? Why would God kill people? You've heard people say that. Why would God kill people if he was so loving? Why would he command his people to kill entire nations? Okay, let me tell you, because God, let me give you an answer. It's so simple, so easy. God is holy. God is holy. And every action, every sin, because of his holiness and because of his just, because of the fact that he is just, he's going to take care and see that he's going to take care of any infraction that comes up against his holiness. And listen to this, listen to how, listen to how, how, how off this thinking is because the only reason we know what holiness is is because of God. I think y'all miss what I'm saying. The only, God is the standard for he. We don't have any morals. We don't have any value. God is the one that put those values and more. We, God is the one that put us in. That's not right to touch a child. That's not right to do this. That's not right to do that. And you know why we have that type of reasoning? Because God put that in us. Now, how can we say the standard bearer is wrong for something when he's the one gave us a standard? Yeah. <laughs> He's a standard. So many people have an issue with texts like this because it shows that God is holy. And, and we, we can squirm, we can squirm at this now. And this is a, exactly what's going to happen if I don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ. There will, there will be recompense for my sin. But let's keep going. Verse 15 again. Look at it. It says, The Lord saw and he relented from the calamity. Look at this. This is so good. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, look what God says. It is enough. That, that's this is what this is what our prayers should be. If this if God, God, our, our prayer should be, God, please don't let no one else be destroyed. God, please don't let anyone else be killed. God, please don't let anybody else be abducted. God, please don't let anybody else be raped. Don't let nobody be molested. This is this ought to be our prayer that where God would say, No, enough it is enough. And look what it says. And now look what God says. Now stay your hand. The angel is literally standing there with his sword drawn. And God says, stay your hand. Stop where you are. Look, the Bible says the angel Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Verse 16. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven. And in his hand, a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. God lets David be able to peep into what's going on in the heavens. And David literally sees this angel of destruction with a sworn drone ready to hit Jerusalem. And God says, stay your hand. If that's not a picture of America, I don't know what is. If that's not a picture of Jacksonville, I don't know what is. If that's not a picture of our families, I don't know what is. The where, where God sends destruction, God sends pain, God sends whatever allows all those things to transpire. And it's our responsibility to know what's going on in the heavenly. And we ought to intercede. We ought to pray. And we ought to say, God, don't let anything, don't let anything else transpired David sees this but the, the, I guess the, I guess the, cl the clincher is this why is the angel there with his sworn drawn because of David <laughs> why is this even happening in the first place because of David's sin and because of what David had done so as a result of what David saw David picked up some sackcloth because David saw something it made David pray <laughs> Oh, y'all miss it. The, 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 the Bible says, then, the, then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth did what? Fell, up, fell upon their faces. See, David, David caused this calamity. David started all of this because he's the leader, because he's the one that, that, that's, the, that's the one that, 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 that controlled what the people were doing. And here, even in our individual lives, there's some things that we can do that can cause some calamities in our lives. 
Look, look at this quote. This is so powerful. Look at this. I've given you this before, but it, I, I felt it bear repeating. You, you are free to make your choices, but you are not free to choose the consequences. <laughs> it's all fine and dandy with us doing what we grown enough to do. I'm grown. I can do what I want to do. You go head on with your grown self. You may get some consequences that you can't wash off. You might get some consequences that you got to keep on dealing with and dealing with and dealing with again. Come on, anybody going to be honest in here that where we did stuff all in the name of fun, we did things all in the name of wanting to be grown, and we got some consequences. So I'm free to make my own choices, but I'm not free to choose the consequences. So it's very important the way I live, and it's very important the decision that I make. The decision I make today can be the life I choose for myself tomorrow. I have to learn to be be very careful how I carry myself. So David is consequent. And, and, and times past, here the way that God will deal with David, God's just gonna deal with David mano a mano. But now, David, because of your sin, because of your error, there are other people that got to pay the consequence. Let's let's keep going. Look at first first Chronicles 21 17. It's good to me, y'all. Look what he said. And David said to God, Was it not I who gave command command to number the people? Is it, is it I who have sinned and done great evil? But these sheep, what have they done? Please, please let your hand, oh Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house. But do not let the plague be on your people. Look at the heart of David. David is saying, God, I'm the one that did this. No one else did it. This is my mess. This is my sin. So now David is going to try to right his wrong. Look what happens first, Chronicle 21, 22. It says, and David said to Ornan, give me the sight of the threshing floor. That place they saw the angel, that place where the, where the angel was there getting ready to continue to destroy. David said, give me this sight of the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. He said, give it to me at its full price that, that the plague may be averted from the people. David says, right here where God is getting ready to destroy, I want to build God an altar. And can I tell you, I didn't plan this or know this was even going to come, but this is a, a reoccurring theme that God continues to want to tell this how the importance of building an altar, the importance of finding myself in a posture the way I'm worshiping God and the way I'm praying to God. And anytime I'm going to worship him fully, anytime I'm going to pray to him fully, it is going to be a price. It's going to cost. It's going. It's going. It's going to be. It's going to be a price. Let, let, let's keep going. Look, David said, "Give me the threshing floor." Isn't that what he said? Yeah. Look at verse twenty-three. Then Ornan said to David, "Take it, and let the Lord, the King, do what seems good to him." See, I give the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing slides for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. He said, "I give it. I give it all." And I tell you that if this would have been some of us, we would have missed it. We would have said, oh, I asked for the threshing flow, and he gave it to me for full price. Come on here. I came, I asked for it, and he gave it to me for free. Oh, but David was so mature. David was so ahead of his time. Look what David's response was. Verse 24, but the king said to Ornan, no, but I will buy them for the full price. Look what he says. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. <laughs> oh my goodness genuine prayer understand that true worship will cost you something <laughs> Oh, come on, y'all. Y'all miss me. G genuine prayer. Understand that true worship will cost you something. Come on. You hear me say it all the time. Every single time we have an offertory appeal, I say give God something that costs you something. And here, that's what worship is. Worship ought to cost you something. I heard, I heard Paul say that I am to present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable sir. I am to get up on the altar, and I am to willingly not squirming, not resist but I am to offer up a sacrifice oh come on there that's why we worship when we tire because it's a sacrifice come on you could have stayed home tonight come on you I know you were tired I know you got people coming around to the house I know you had to clean the bathroom and glue this and do that but no it's a sacrifice to break away and you'll say I'll stay up a little bit later tonight but I got to get to the house of the Lord and whatever I got to do tomorrow I'll let that be done tomorrow but for tonight I got to offer God some worship and some praise and some glory come on here some about it. Real prayer, real worship will cost 
It's going to cost you something. Stop, stop giving God something that didn't cost you anything. Stop tipping God and not sacrificing to him. This is what this is what so the tithe, the offering, all this plays a part because we we act like we do God a favor and we take that for worship. That's not worship, just throwing God twenty dollars or throwing God fifty dollars. Not when your tithe's supposed to be two hundred, not when it's supposed to be a hundred dollars, not when it's supposed to be whatever, and you just throw God. You, hey, we better be glad I gave something. No, no, no. That's not how that's not how it works. He uh, I guess I can have a whole message on this, and I think I will in January. Look, 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 look. <laughs> Look, look what happened. Let me, let me speed up. Look what happened. First Chronicles 21, 26 says, And David built there an altar to the Lord and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar, the burnt offering. Verse 27, Then the Lord commanded the angel, and he put his sword back into his sheath. David interceded. David worshiped. He sacrificed and did what he needed to do so here that the people would not have to pay for his error and his sins. And this is why I believe the Bible says that David is a man as after God's own heart. So now that's the backdrop. That, that's the story. This is what they say was going on. They called David to write Psalm 30. He either wrote this psalm, which we're going to see in a moment. He wrote this psalm for the dedication of a temple that he could not build. Or he wrote this song as a response to his sin after he messed up with God. Uh, be that as it may, you're going to see it amplified here through this Psalm 30. Now, let me read it for you. Look at Psalm 30 and 1. It says, a psalm, a song at the dedication of the temple, a psalm of David. Look what David says. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. Oh, my friend, what, what is David teaching us? David is teaching us that prayer, come on here, will save uh, my life. Yes, sir. That's what David is saying. David is saying, that I was supposed to be destroyed I was supposed to be killed because of my sin, because of my error he said but because I went to the threshing floor, because I built that altar, it literally saved my life and not just my life, it saved everybody's life connected to me would anybody be honest that if you hadn't prayed, if you hadn't spent time with God you thought like you was going to lose your mind you thought you was going to end it all you thought you couldn't make it another day but when I talked to God and spent time with him God help me and prayer Save, baby, save, and save. And save my life. Yeah. Yes, it did. This is what David said. Let me let me let me speed on here. David said, I'm gonna exalt you. David said, I'm gonna worship you. David said, I'm gonna lift you up. Look at this quote. I lift him up in worship because he lifted me up from the ruins. Come on. I told you, David is testifying now. David is saying, I lift him up because he lifted me up. David has said, I lift him up where I am. Oh, because he lifted me up from where I was. Oh, I heard one song say, When nothing else could help. Yes, sir. Love lifted me. Anybody want to testify tonight? And that's why you come and that's why you're thankful. That's why you're grateful that the fact that God lifted you from the muck, he lifted you from the ruin, he lifted you when you felt like you were going to lose your mind, he picked you up, he turned you around and placed your feet on. Yes, he did. Love lifted me. David is testifying. Let me keep going. I'm almost there. Look at verse 2. It says, oh Lord. Look what he says. Oh Lord my God. This is what David said. He said, I cried to help. Look at this. I cried to you for what? For help. Look what he said. And you have healed me. Good God. David is testifying. He said, I was in a mess God. I, I thought I was getting ready to build and you told me no. I thought I was getting ready to go and you told me no. I thought I was getting ready to do this and you told me no. And then I cried out for you to help and you healed me. It anybody know anything about having a broken heart? Come on, my daddy taught me a lot about love, but when he taught me about love, he always had an album and he taught, put a song on what will we, what shall become of the broken heart and who has love that now departed? Y'all ain't gonna help me here. Can I tell you, have you ever had a broken heart? Have you ever had somebody drop you? Have you ever had somebody walk away from you, abandon you and when you were down there, thought you couldn't go on, you thought you couldn't make it and the Lord, you cried out for him for help and he healed your broken heart. Oh, my friend, can I tell you, God will heal your broken heart. God will let you love again. God will let you trust again. God will let you have family again. Yes, he will. I, I'm, I'm getting ready to go. I, I, I came to tell the Lord, thank you tonight. I don't know what y'all came for, a little pretty Bible study, but I came to tell him, thank you. I'm trying my best here. Look, 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 look what they, they say. They, they say it. He said, I cried out for, that's David. They, they, they say, I cried out for help. 
And look, God, look what God did. God didn't necessarily heal him the way we think we was gonna, he was going to heal him. But look, look what he did. He didn't help him rather the way that he thought it helped. So genuine prayer understands that when I cry out for help, he will heal. Yes, sir, boy, you preaching. When, when I cry at somebody online, about to tear their computer up, type of that thing. They, somebody been ready to tear that little iPhone up, tear that new phone up. They, 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 they're putting emojis and all, and all that. Can I tell you? Because you asked God to help you, and He healed you. You asked God to give you a miracle, and He healed your mind. You asked God to give you a hearing, a miracle, and He healed your soul. You asked God to give you a miracle. You, you don't need no money. You need God to do something in your mind. You need God to do something in your soul. David said, I cried out to him and he, he healed me. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm almost done. Look, look, look. Look what David says. Look what he says. Verse 3. Verse 3 says, Verse 3 says, Give me a little, a little more. Is there any more in there? Can I get a little bit more in there? Is there a little more? Give me a little more bottle. Anybody say, I don't know if there's anything else in there. Give me a little more in there. Look, look, look what he says. Oh, oh Lord. Look what they, they say. Oh, Lord. You have brought my life from Sheol, from the place of the dead. Look what David said. David said, you have brought me from hell. That's what David said. That was Sheol is the place of the dead. That anybody ever felt like they were going, they're going through hell? Anybody ever felt like, man, if it ain't one thing, it's another? Anybody ever had people and relationships and all types of things biting at you and hitting at you at one time? David said, you brought my life down from the pit. In fact, David said, I started from the bottom. And David said, but now, yeah, he said, you have kept me alive. That I should not go down to the pit. My God, can I tell you that God have kept you alive? If God wanted you dead, you'll be dead a long time ago. If God didn't want you here, come on, that last prognosis, that last stray bullet. Come on, but God said he kept you alive. And God kept you alive because he kept you here for, for a reason. God, whew, I'm getting there. They, David, David is testifying. He's telling the Lord, thank you. Look, look, look. Look, look, I'm trying my best here. Look, look, look what he says. He says, sing, verse 4, sing praises to the Lord. Oh, you his saints. Look what he says. And give thanks to his holy name. Oh, David, David now, this is so powerful. Don't miss this, y'all. It's the best part. of. I, I think this, this is my favorite part right here. D David got himself together. He really did. This is so powerful. Verses 1 through 3, David is getting himself together. He's reminding himself of all the things that God did for him. Now look at Day Day. He says, he says, oh, you his saints, give thanks to his name. Now David goes from getting himself together to gathering a congregation and say, oh, you know what he said in one place? He said, oh, magnify the Lord. Oh, y'all some Bible students. Who y'all pastors? Y'all know the word. He said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, come on. Can I tell you that God desires to bless you and help you not just for yourself, but God desires for you tomorrow before you cut up that fried turkey. God wants you to be able to stand up and tell your family that God is good. The only reason why we got this dressing, the only reason why we got this macaroni and cheese, the only reason why we got this sweet potato pie, the only reason why we got this lemon meringue cake is because the Lord has been good to me. And David said, come on, saints, let's give him some praise in here. <laughs> that wasn't metaphorical. I mean, come on, y'all, give him some praise in here. That's what I mean. <laughs> I'm done. And don't leave me, baby. Hey, baby, don't leave me, baby. Baby, don't leave me, baby. Baby, don't leave me, baby. I preach better when you're here, baby. Please come back. Look. Look what they, they say. Verse 5. I'm done. Give me a portion of verse 5. Look what it says. For... <laughs> <laughs> for his anger is but for a moment. I don't know what again happened. What, what, why was God angry? He was angry because David had sinned. And it wasn't that God was angry. It's the fact that God was chastening him for his error and for his mistake. And here David comes to this revelation that God, I may have messed up. I may, I may have, to have a recompense for what I've done. But David said his anger is just for a moment. So no matter how I'm ch being chased. And come on, there's somebody that may be listening to me right now. That you're, you're paying, you're reaping the harvest of your bad decisions. You're reaping the harvest of you doing some things that you knew you should not have done. 
God is not angry with you. God does, God does love you. And the enemy will plan in your mind that God don't love me because I did this, because I smoked that, because I drunk that, because I sexed that, because I did that. But no, his anger is only but for a moment. Oh, David got this revelation. He said that I may be experiencing the chasing of the Lord and God beats me, God whips me, God chases me because he loves me. Look at verse 5. David said for his anger endured but for a moment. But look what it says. In his favor is life. Yes, sir. David said in my life, the fact that I'm still alive, it lets me know that I'm God's favorite. Yes, sir. God has his favor on me. Oh, come on here, somebody. I know you don't think you God's favorite, but I'm God's favorite. You can get in where you fit in. Can I tell you that I know that God loves me. Oh, but David says this, my favorite verse. I say it almost every time I preach. Look what David says. Weeping. Uh, David said, I messed up. I, I committed a sin. I err. He said, but weeping, mate, y'all missed that, y'all. David said that weeping will. No, sir. He said weeping may. Can I tell you? Oh, that it may. It's not, it's not guaranteed. Come on, you may not be crying all night. Weeping may endure for a night. But look what he says. But joy is coming in the morning. What birthed this revelation? It was his pain. What birthed this revelation? But what David had gone through. And that's what I come to tell you tonight, you all. In in this time of thanksgiving as we look at this psalm of thanksgiving as we look at how God has been good to us you may be crying right now oh but you won't be crying forever you may be feeling down right now you won't be feeling down forever you may be feeling depressed but you won't be feeling depressed forever oh but can I tell you God will take that thing that brought that momentary pain to bring you a moment a monumental breakthrough come on here somebody I said God to give you momentary pain that way you can have a monumental breakthrough breakthrough that where you'll be able to look back over your life and said if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side I don't know where in the world I'll be God will give you a blessing God will pull you up and lift you up to be where you need to be at oh but look what David said in verse 11 he said you have turned my morning yes sir he said you have turned me from morning into dancing David said you took me from morning I was feeling bad for myself I was in depression I felt all ignorant I felt all and away from God. Oh, but David said he turned my morning into dancing. Come on, somebody. You ought to give him some praise up in here. I said give him some praise up in here. I said give him some praise up in here. I said give him some praise up in here. David said you turned my morning into dancing. I said David said he turned my morning into dancing. Come on, give him some praise up in here. Come on, y'all. I'm getting ready to ride up tonight. I know it's a Wednesday. I know it's a Wednesday night. But I feel like blazing. I feel like blazing on this Thursday night. I was looking for y'all at noonday. But I searched all over and couldn't find nobody. But now I'm so glad that I got the band now. Because I got a praise down in my spirit. I got a praise down in the city of my soul. I heard... I heard David say that he'll turn my morning into dancing. The same thing got you crying. It's going to call you to dance tomorrow. What got you crying today going to have you dancing tomorrow. Because I heard... I heard Paul say, for we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Can I tell you to God, if you're trying to give you a testimony, can I tell you to God, they're trying to let you know that it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's all by my spirit. I got to let y'all go, but I heard. I heard Isaiah say in Isaiah 61 and 3 he said to appoint unto them that morn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes he said the oil of joy for mourning God said he gonna give me the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness can I tell you what the devil does at times like this he have you think about everybody you lost he have you think about everybody that's going on he have you thinking about all the things that you no longer have and he wants you to soak he wants you to be upset 
because your family not around because your friends not around but God said will you allow me to give you a divine a divine exchange he said I'll take your mourning and I'll give you joy he said I'll take your sorrow and I'll give you peace the Lord said I'll take that thing that got you feeling down if you'll give it to me I'll do more for you he said if you give it to me I give you joy I give you peace I'm so glad that trouble don't last always is there anybody in here that gotta thank you for the Lord thank you for January thank you for February thank you for March April May thank you for June and July thank you for every month for every day for every decade for every height for every death thank you when I'm at the cemetery thank you when I'm at hospice thank you when I got foreclosure thank you for the bankruptcy thank you for the repossession in everything good God I feel like preaching I said in everything y'all don't want me to preach tonight I said in everything I'm gonna give you thanks and because this is this is the will the will of God concerning you truth and love you ought to give him praise truth and love you ought to give him glory because we've been made endure for a night but joy I gotta let y'all go I said I've been eating good all week I said joy joy Joy, come come in the morning. I said joy. I got joy down in my soul. I got joy in my heart. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and it can't take it away. Come on, give him some praise.